Thank you very much, Sixth. So, two years ago, I wrote a paper comparing the communication strategies of a 21st century Krav Maga manual with several late medieval fight books. Today, I would like to continue in this direction and explore possible ways of studying fight books in comparative perspective. In order to do that, we need to work with rather open terms. Any written account on theory and practice of armed and unarmed combat is thus designated as a fight book. With this very broad definition, everything from uh, personal notebooks on martial arts training to commercial products like printed martial arts manuals qualifies as a fight book. Today, I want to use this whole spectrum and discuss four German fight books, two of them from the late Middle Ages and two modern examples from the 21st century. I want to use these four case studies as a starting point for the development of overarching questions that, that can be used to compare fight books on different century, of different centuries and different cultural backgrounds. One of my guiding assumptions is that a crucial feature of fight books is the organization of embodied knowledge by the use of written accounts. Fight books offer a way to address the abundant complexity of fighting with its many variables and to reflect upon different ways of fighting. They are thus attempts to address embodied technique as a form of transmissible knowledge. But though the technical dimension of fight books is what makes them unique sources, fight books must not be reduced to this aspect. In fact, fight books tell us a lot more about discourses on fighting than they tell us about the actual fighting practice itself. I would like to illustrate this with the help of a late medieval drawing that got me thinking. The picture is from one of my case studies, a 15th century manuscript on the teachings of Master Hans Thalhofer. It shows a man armed with a two-handed sword who is fighting against an attacker with a composite halberd. The text says, the final technique with a long sword against the halberd. From a martial arts point of view, the depicted technique does not seem very elaborate and in contrast to other fight books from the same period, there is almost no information on the tact tactical dimension or the context of application. Instead of showing a crucial moment in the execution, the artist chose to depict the technique's conclusion and the moment when the attacker's head is cut off and he's already losing his grip on the halberd while his head is falling to the ground. The drawing thus transmits only very little information on the fighting technique itself, something that we usually see as the most characteristic feature of fight books. In this case, however, the technique's effect on a living human body is depicted. But if this picture is not primarily about codification, about the codification and transmission of technique, then what it is about? Obviously, it imagines the effect of violence on the vulnerable human body with spraying blood and even anatomic details like the attacker's cut gullet. At the same time, as fight books always seem to adopt the perspective of the active and succeeding part in a confrontation, it offers a narrative how to counteract the depicted threat of being harmed or killed. By using the teachings of Master Talofa, the attacker is defeated and the unharmed defendant is able to simply chop his head off. The central message is that this attacker will never pose a threat again. I will therefore argue in this presentation that apart from organizing embodied knowledge, fight books serve as a means of coping with violence and managing the ultimate contingency of fighting. In combination with training fighting systems, writing and reading fight books thus creates fighting as a discursive object. I will get back to this idea at the end of my talk. As you can see, I chose a rather heterogeneous sample of fight books. Three of them are manuscripts, one is printed, two of them are medieval codices, while the other two are from the 21st century. I will start with a modern example because it will be much e easier to explore authorial intentions, um, modes of production, contexts of use, and situations of reception if we are more familiar with the societal context of the document. Of course, the gained insights cannot be directly applied to pre-modern sources, but they may help us to ask better questions when we are addressing the medieval material. The first fight book is a 21st century notebook consisting of 93 unfoliated leaves of squared paper 
measuring 145 by 200 millimeters. It has a blue cardboard binding that shows significant wear on the edge, on the edges, as well as some water stains. Only the Folia 1 recto to 18 verso and 86 recto to 87 recto contain an unskilled handwriting in pencil from one hand, the other pages are blank. A closer look at the spine suggests that at least seven leaves were ripped out rather carelessly, which could suggest a total of 100 pages once the notebook was complete. The writing is German, but it also contains several Japanese expressions like Yamatsuki, Hikite, or Shirogeri, whereas the romanization of Japanese terms is often inconsistent. Most of the entries are using bullet points to structure rather short remarks on the execution of fighting techniques. Some of them are illustrated by unskilled drawings depicting the human body or footwork patterns. The entries are mostly using a nominal style or they are organized around infinitive constructions summarizing concrete instructions how to execute a specific technique. 17 entries are dated. The earliest entry is from May 2004 the latest from February 2008. The majority of 11 out of 17 dated entries was made between May 2004 and January 2005. An inscription on the flyleaf also specifies the system and the master, stating that the book contains, I, cite, uh, I, I quote, training goals and technical details in the karate training with Risto. Another interesting feature is a folded yellow leaflet held by a paper clip. It contains a bilingual questionnaire in Japanese and German. The leaflet mentions two karate associations, the JKA and the DJKB, and it serves as an application form to be registered in Japan as bearer of a certain degree of black belt. The fee for this registration has to be paid in advance, and it ranges from 80 euro for a first degree black belt up to 235 euro for a fifth degree. What do these observations tell us about the scribe? his intended audience, and the circumstances of his writing. The notebook was used to put down training goals and technical details of an unarmed fighting system called karate, learned from a certain teacher who is just referred to as Risto. We thus seem to have a case where a practitioner took notes during an extended period of learning to organize his embodied knowledge by the use of writing. The project seems to have been begun in May 2004, with quite regular entries until the beginning of 2005. Then the scribe seems to have lost interest, and in 2008, he finally stopped using the notebook altogether, leaving many pages blank. The significant wear of the binding suggests that the notebook was not kept in a study, but it might have been carried around, maybe allowing to take, to take or to review notes directly in a training context. Writing down learned lessons thus seems to have served as a mnemonic tool to relieve the memory of the practitioner. One important prerequisite for this project is literacy, whereas the scribe seems to um, have mastered only the German language as the inconsistencies in the Japanese term suggest. Nevertheless, taking notes, dating, dating entries, and using simple drawings to illustrate embodied technique suggests a certain familiarity with the learned culture. We also see that the transmission of uh, the fighting system karate was based on a specific lexis containing Japanese terms, which were used to designate complex techniques or technical sequences. The mention of the teacher Risto on the flyleaf points to a situation of personal contact during the um, process of acquiring a body technique, and the fact that a fighting system, system is often um, attached to individuals that incarnate the abstract system. The yellow leaflet referring to black belt examinations furthermore points to the evaluation of learned technique by a community of practitioners and the existence of teaching authorities that control the distribution of social status among practitioners. Furthermore, as the scale of fees on the leaflet indicates, there is also money involved. There is yet another reason why I chose this fight book as my first example. As you might have already suspected, it is my own personal notebook which I used in the preparation for my Shotokan Karate Black Belt examination in January 2005. And at that time, I had not yet heard anything about fight books. Having started karate at the age of 10, I had changed my teacher about two years before I started using the book. I was thus learning a new approach towards karate training, 
working with Risto Kiskele, a sixth Dan instructor within the German branch of the Japanese Karate Association. It was his style of karate that I tried to incorporate during the time of my black belt preparation. After the examination, which was obviously the reason for increasing my training efforts and for taking notes, I used the book only occasionally when I prepared for competitions or gained new insights. It was yet not only the fact that I now had my black belt that made me stop writing about karate. It was rather the fact that I had incorporated Risto's approach and that I did not need to rely on writing anymore because my body had learned his teachings by heart. If we now turn to the anonymous Codex 3227A from Nuremberg, we will see that it has several features in common with my own notebook. The Codex is a very small book that consists of 166 leaves of paper and three leaves of vellum with a dimension of 100 to 140 millimeters. All pages are written by one scribe, but in distinct stages of writing and with different inks. It is dated approximately to um, 1389 and is therefore presumably the oldest surviving manuscript mentioning uh, the German martial arts teacher Johannes Lichtenauer, whose system influenced martial arts treatises for about 200 years. The handwriting is skilled but not calligraphic and some paragraphs are sloppier than others. The main part of the codex consists of uh, various short texts with heterogeneous practical instructions, often multiple on the same page. They contain descriptions of various alchemical and medical recipes, technical instructions for tempering iron and making gunpowder, as well as rituals that we would commonly label as magic. Some of the larger paragraphs are descriptions of fighting techniques with various weapons. Most of them refer to the master Johannes Lichtenauer, who is presented as the founder of the described art. The description of his fighting system is yet incomplete, and most of the loosely connected text fragments dispersed all over the codex break off quite suddenly. The core of these teachings are mnemonic verses attributed to Lichtenauer himself. The verses mainly consist of specialized technical terms referring to techniques or concepts and they are intentionally shorted and encrypted to ensure that only initiates could understand their meaning. The verses therefore only serve as mnemonic anchors that help to memorize and organize practical knowledge and it's very likely that they were initially intended for an oral use. As you can see, the scribe put down Lichtenauer's didactic verses in a first stage of writing and left several pages blank to gloss these verses later. This works, yeah. See, here is the, the part where the verses end and the glosses start. He, tried to he then tried to explain their meaning and to deduce practical fencing instructions in prose. He is thus translating the secret and encrypted art into a description of body movements in his own words. Based on a codicological analysis, I have argued elsewhere that the now bound codex once consisted of multiple separate notebooks with a limp vellum binding. The author used some of this, these notebooks to put down the didactic verses of Lichtenauer's fighting system, leaving several pages between the verses blank. Then he started to write his commentaries and to explain the techniques mentioned in the encrypted verses. He also added general thoughts on martial arts sometimes correcting his former statements in the light of new insights and, as I argue, after making progress as a student of Lichtenauer's fighting system. In a second stage of writing, he used Lichtenauer's specific technical lexis to describe um, techniques with weapons outside of the master's curriculum. Therefore, it seems that the scribe used the technical lexis of Lichtenauer's system in order to systematize what he knew about the use of other weapons. Then, at a certain point, he stopped to write about martial arts systems and began to fill up some of the blank space on his, in his martial arts notebooks with cooking recipes, technical instructions, rituals, and information that seemed useful to him. During an uncertain period, but probably over many years, the scribe collected around 610 such texts and instructions. At a last stage, the separate notebooks were put in an order, bound together to a single codex, and the pages were numbered. As you can see, the scribe also added a small table of contents to organize the information he had collected over years. Just like my own personal notebook, the manuscript therefore is not a manual that aims at the instruction of an intended audience. 
It consists of the assorted notes of a martial arts practitioner who was trained using Lichtenauer's system and who was taking notes to memorize his practical lessons. If we now compare these two notebooks, we see many shared features. Both are attempts to systematize um, fighting to support a process of embodying technique, and both rely on a specific technical lexis to designate complex techniques of the body. Writing thus serves as a mnemonic technique. But as the literacy rate was much low lower in the Middle Ages, the 14th century notebook is, rather, is a rather outstanding document that proves the existence of a group of learned people who are practicing martial arts. There are yet some very interesting features of the Codex 3227A that we do not find in my notebook. The anonymous scribe also wrote an extensive prologue in which Lichtenauer is portrayed as the authority behind the system and in which its origin is depicted. This preface begins with a very remarkable passage, I quote, here begins Master Lichtenauer's art of fighting with a sword, on foot and on horseback, bare and in armor. And before all things and matters, you should perceive and know that there is only one art of the sword. And this art may have been invented and conceived some hundred years ago. And this art is the base and the core of all arts of fighting. And Master Lichtenauer possessed and mastered this art wholly, completely and accurately. Not that he had invented and conceived it himself, as it is written before. But he has traveled and searched many lands because of this justified and true art which he wanted to learn and know. And this art is serious, complete, and justified." End of quote. In the following paragraphs, the scribe furthermore distinguishes between Lichtenauer's art of fighting and the ineffective teachings of false masters who would flaunt that they had invented new and better ways of fighting while their actual skills were in fact very poor and their art was useless in serious combat. Sounds familiar, huh? Um, opposed to these frauds, Lichtenauer is described as a teacher of great experience and someone who systematized the art of fighting without claiming to have invented it, while his fighting system is straightforward and designed to, for serious fighting. These extensive polemics against other masters clearly indicate that there were, there were competing fighting systems striving for some sort of discursive hegemony in the late 14th century. Another important detail of the manuscript is that the scribe distinguishes between different contexts of fighting. He differentiates between serious fighting and Schulfechten, which would be best translated literally as school fighting, referring to a non-lethal fighting exercise in a controlled environment. We thus have an indication for social norms structuring specific forms of fighting and limiting the degree of socially accepted violence. My next example is the German translation of a Krav Maga manual written by Darren Levine and John Whitman in 2007. The title of the English version is Krav Maga, the ultimate guide to over 250 self-defense and combative techniques. And I chose the 214 second edition of the German translation because it was the best-selling book in the category Martial Arts and Self-Defense on Amazon Germany when I wrote my comparison between modern, medi modern and medieval fight books in September 2015. I checked it yesterday, the book is still holding rank two in that category. It is a printed book of 352 pages measuring uh, 190 to 240 millimeters with a soft cover binding and a large number of monochrome photographs. In contrast to our other examples, it is an item of mass production that has an ISBN number and is currently sold at a price of 19 euro 99. The book has a very clear structure and it is didactically, didactically organized. It contains several lessons of increasing complexity, each describing specific sets of techniques. There are also several paratexts, such as testimonials, prefaces, and an introduction to the Krav Maga system and its history. The techniques are represented by a combination of texts and up to 10 serial images. The images are numbered to mark each step of the execution, and the short uh, texts are directly referring to specific images. If we now look at the communication strategies at work, we see that texts and images are simulating a face-to-face -face instruction in which a teacher usually demonstrates a specific technique and explains the movements. 
The book's primary concern is thus to transmit knowledge to a group of absent readers by the use of texts and depictions. At the same time, the preface of the Krav Maga manual specifies that the depicted techniques must be trained with a partner, at best under, under the guidance of an experienced instructor certified by Darren Levine's Krav Maga organization. The book must, thus must be seen as an attempt, attempt to communicate information by the use of the medium to absentees. Yet, by mentioning the need to train the techniques with a partner, um, we also, the authors also envisage a communication about the book um, among attendees. For example, when two training partners are discussing the described techniques in order to understand and train them. At the same time, the book also works as a way to, of advertising its author and the system, the system alike. It is a way of self-fashioning, especially because the author, Darren Levine, is depicted demonstrating the more advanced techniques himself, himself successfully neutralizing attackers that are armed with automatic pistols and rifles. We also have various hints about the social context for which the techniques are designed. The system is described as an, I quote, simple, aggressive, easy to learn, and easy to remember system of self-defense, end of quote. If you think of the preface to Lichtenauer's Art of Fighting, this promising phrase sounds quite familiar. Krav Maga is furthermore described as being neither sport nor a martial art, but as originating in a military and law enforcement context. The attempt to distinguish Krav Maga from competing systems is thus very obvious in the manual. Furthermore, the book contains several attempts to legitimize the system and the authors. Among other text strategies, the first page starts with several testimonials, including a statement of Emil Lichtenfeld, who praises the outstanding skills of Darren Levine. Lichtenfeld, who lived from 1910 to 1998, is the founder and you could say grandmaster of Krav Maga, who invented the system in the late 1940s for the Israel Defense Force. Not unlike our preface from Manuscript 3227a, his history is told in a subsection of the book, and the text puts special emphasis on the effectiveness of his system in real, that is, serious and life-threatening combat situations. The Krav Maga manual thus shows quite a few familiar features with our first medieval example. We have the narrative about the system's origin, several attempts to legitimize the system by referring to the authority and the skills of its founder, or in this case, the founder student. Furthermore, we can clearly identify the polemics directed against competing systems, and we also have indications for a discourse on social norms of fighting. In this case, the book conceptualizes fighting as a matter of life and death, without the involvement of any social norms restricting the use of violence. But we also have new features. This manual is using serial depictions and texts in order to simulate a situation of face-to-face -face instruction. In contrast to the first two examples, um, primarily dedicated to the organization of personal knowledge, we thus have an attempt to communicate information by the use of the book to an audience of absent readers. At the same time, the book already anticipates its use as a medium for a communication about the book among attendees. Furthermore, the book is closely connected to self-fashioning and marketing. It is a promotion for the system Krav Maga, for the author Darren Levine, and for his organization Krav Maga Worldwide, which turns a fighting system into a commercial brand. So once again, there's money involved. Our last case study is another medieval codex, this time from the 15th century. It is an extensive and lavishly illuminated paper manuscript of 150 leaves, measuring 210 to 300 millimeters, that depicts a broad spectrum of armed and unarmed fighting techniques in large-sized drawings. The book was composed in uh, 1459, and the depicted techniques are linked to the fencing master Hans Thalhofer who is represented as author of the described fighting system. Though the biography of Talofa still remains a desideratum and further research, research is urgently needed, he is traceable in the sources between 1433 and 1482. He seems to have been a member of the Marx Brothers, a German fencing fraternity that received an imperial privilege in 1487, granting it the exclusive right of promoting a fighter to the rank of Master of the Long Sword. Today, we still have access to five 15th century manuscripts 
depicting Talofa's fighting system, which were created between 1443 and 1467. If we closely examine these manuscripts, they can be grouped in two categories. The Gotha manuscript and our example from Copenhagen were probably personal manuscripts owned by Talofa himself to serve as compendia and as archetypes for the other manuscripts. The other three manuscripts were owned by noblemen who are in two cases also represented in the manuscripts as combat combatants and as disciples of Master Talofa. It is thus very likely that they, are, they, they were trained by him and that they received their personal manuscripts as some sort of documentation of their actual martial education. If this is the case, the books were not, like the Krav Maga manual, intended for the communication of information to absent readers. Instead, the student versions served as mnemonic aids to remember lessons that were taught beforehand in a face-to-face -face instruction with Talofa himself. The other two compendia, which were owned by Talofa, could have been used to memorize the didactic system he used in his teaching. At the same time, they could have served as some sort of catalog to show potential clients which techniques the master would teach them. That could explain why the excellent drawings are not accompanied by explanatory texts or verses. The Copenhagen manuscript only contains very short captions, which do not explain but only denominate the de depicted techniques. In, many, case, in many, many cases, even these captions are missing. As this example shows, Talofa's system was also not designed for a playful or sport-like context of use. Though these high-quality drawings activate the reader's motor imagery, and the manuscript sometimes even uses up to two serial depictions, they are not capable of transmitting tactical information and of linking complex motion sequences. Like the intentionally encrypted mnemonic verses of Lichtenauer, the images of Talofa require prior specialized knowledge to be understood as symbols referring to complex fighting techniques. Like the verses of Lichtenauer, the images of Talofa should therefore be understood as mnemonic references for a tested knowledge that the addressees already possessed because they were trained by Talofa himself. To clarify what I propose, let's take a look at one of the drawings that depicts techniques uh, not related to fighting. What you see is an image referring to encryption techniques. The caption on the left says, this Ron writes on a court ball. Obviously, he is transmitting a message by adding knots to the cord. The person in the middle does not have a caption, but the action of the writer on the right is specified as, this one writes from or off the mouth and turns black. If we think of these drawings as mnemonic anchors or some sort of catalog for skills the owner Talofa offers to teach, the depiction makes perfect sense. But for the instruction of absent readers, they are pretty much useless. If we thus turn to our comparison with the Krav Maga manual, we see that even the Copenhagen manuscript offers at least some serial depictions. Like the Krav Maga system, it is designed for situations of life-threatening violence, and the book also works as some sort of promotion for the author and its system. The similarities are even quite obvious if we compare the author representations in both books. Yet in contrast to the Krav Maga manual, Talofa's books were no commercial goods, but unique pieces of craftsmanship made for specific addresses. I therefore argue that they were not intended for the instruction of absent readers, but were primarily used for a communication about the book between attendees, that is, the teacher and his student, or later, the student and his training partner. Now I'd like you to take a step back from all the material I've just presented and um, to switch to a macro and then to a meter level of analysis. If we are looking at fight books, we are looking at ways to refer to embodied technique. <clears throat> Following the brilliant work of Ben Spatz, I understand this term in the following manner. I quote, technique differs from related concepts like performativity and habitus in that it em emphasizes the epistemic dimension of practice. Embodied technique then refers to transmissible and repeatable knowledge of relatively reliable possibilities afforded by human embodiment." End of quote. Technique is thus defined as the knowledge content of spe specific practices. According to Spatz, 
The term practice only refers to concrete instances of actions that are defined by the acting person, the time and the location of the action. Moments of practice are thus unique and not repeatable, and they are structured yet not determined by technique. In contrast to practice, technique is repeatable in varying situations and contexts. And as knowledge, it is not innate, but socially acquired. Technique, uh, technique is thus not ahistorical, as Spatz notes, but transhistorical. It spreads from body to body and from society to society. Fight books can thus be seen as attempts to record, transmit, theorize, organize, or represent techniques structuring fighting. I tried to map the relationship between fighting practices, techniques, and the attempts to refer to this embodied technique uh, or this embodied knowledge by the use of texts or depictions um, in another paper which is available online. Therefore, I would like to leave this macro level for now and switch to a meter level. On a societal level, fight books clearly indicate that there is an ongoing discourse on fighting technique. Different styles of fighting and different systems are competing with each other. They are yet not only competing on the battleground, but also striving for discursive hegemony. We thus have to take a look at discourses and practices alike. The concept of discourse I am applying here is derived from the works of Michel Foucault. Discourse therefore not only refers to a more formal speech or any kind of speaking, talk or conversation. Instead, the term discourse refers to a strongly bounded area of knowledge, a system of statements within which the world can be known. The most important aspect of this theoretical perspective is that the world is not simply there for us to discover or to, to talk about. Rather, it is through discourse itself that the world is brought into being. Discourse is thus the complex of signs and practices which organizes social existence and social re reproduction. Discourse symbolically organizes the world and transforms it into an object of human knowledge. At the same time, discourse structures the way social beings are referring to the world. It is composed of a set of rules that order the virtually limitless number of possible statements by excluding certain statements and thus establishing socially accepted truths. If we now get back to the fight books, we see that writing a book on fighting is not fighting itself. It is a way of turning fighting into an object of human knowledge by making statements about the techniques structuring fighting. Fight books are thus creating different ways of fighting as a discursive object. Therefore, I want to take a closer look at different practices that are creating fighting as a discursive object. In order to stay close to one of our modern examples, I chose self-defense against knife attacks as a modern example. I'm hereby partly leaving the grounds of discourse analysis by drawing on the new materialist approach of Anna-Marie Moll's study, The Body Multiple, Ontology in Medical Practice. In this book, Moll applies a method she calls praxeography to analyze how the disease, atherosclerosis, is done, enacted or practiced in different contexts and by different people. Okay, so we've just reached a critical point in this presentation. If you are into cultural theory, epistemology, French people writing crazy stuff, great, <laughs> piece of cake. But if you're not, then I would invite you to see the following as an experiment of thought. Let's assume that the world outside of your thinking is not a stable thing that is just found or discovered by your subjective or by, by our subjective perceptions. Instead, let's switch perspectives and not think of the world as the object of our thinking, but start from the subject. The underlying principle of all sorts of constructivist thinking is that the world, especially the meaningful social world, is not out there to be discovered, but that it is created through our thinking and our continuous practice. Yet, this is first of all an epistemological, not an ontological statement. It does not mean that there is no objective material reality. It just means that the way we perceive reality is subjectively and socially constructed. So to get back to Moll's work, her underlying assumption is that the disease, atherosclerosis, is not just there. Instead, she switches perspectives and looks at many different and contrasting practices taking place in a hospital, 
for example, doctor-patient relationships, uh, doctor-patient interviews, different forms of medical examination, the use of microscopes, dissection, dissection of extracted veins and pathology, and so on. She argues that these different practices or different actors are in combination creating the disease, atherosclerosis, as a point of reference and as an object we know something about. She calls this a common virtual object. New materialists are therefore focusing on events and practices in which ever-changing and shifting realities are constantly produced or enacted in negotiation with the material world. If we now get back to fighting and the example of self-defense against knife attacks, um, which are also treated in our Krav Maga manual, we see that writing a book about fighting is not really fighting. It is creating knowledge on fighting and thus establishing fighting as an object of discourse. If we thus switch perspectives and ask what is knife fighting in our current society and which practices enact knife fighting, thereby turning it into an object of knowledge and discourse, we'll get an understanding of what it means to create knife fighting as a common virtual object. The fight itself is a state of high emotional, uh, emotional and physical stress. Adrenaline rush, subconscious actions and reactions and frequently the participants do not clearly recall the course of action. Actual fighting thus has the potential to escape discourse. That does not mean that there is no discourse on fighting, as the fight books it clearly indicate it's quite the opposite. But the concrete fighting practice itself is hard to put into words. It has to be enwrapped in discourse. After a fight, the injuries might be read as traces of fighting. A trial is also a practice in which knife fighting might be enacted, narrated, analyzed, judged, and thus created as a discursive object. Trauma therapy marks another attempt to put fighting into words and to cope with suffering from violence or overcoming violent urges. Discussions on internet platforms on how to deal with knife attacks, how to prepare for them, what to train and so on, also create knife fighting as an element of discourse. And there's YouTube. Making, watching and commenting instructional videos on how to defend against knife attacks or watching and commenting CCTV footage works in the same way. As does participating in training sessions or self-defense seminars on knife fighting. Training fighting systems might be one of the core practices that are creating fighting as a common virtual object. To further emphasize this, training a fighting system is not fighting. It is a simulation of fighting. And this simulation is a way of generating knowledge on what fighting is for the practitioners, how they might address it in their statements, what vocabulary they use, which statements are perceived as true or false within a group of practitioners, and so on. To write a book about fighting techniques and fighting systems just adds another layer on how violence and fighting as social practice are enwrapped in discourse. Fighting systems, therefore, serve as means to reduce complexity and to facilitate communication. By the use of a system, the contingent situation of combat becomes describable and manageable for the practitioners. Furthermore, fighting systems offer a way to address the threat of violence and the contingency of fighting. As every human being is potentially vulnerable and every fight is ultimately unpredictable, fighting systems are promising a way to even the odds and to prepare for these extreme situations. But as there are several competing systems, practitioners are always in doubt whether they are training the right system under the guidance of the right teacher. This structural problem is reflected in many of the fight books. If we thus look at fight books from other historical periods, we should keep in mind that it is not the actual fighting practice that is documented in these fascinating sources. It is a way to address fighting and to turn it into an object of knowledge and discourse. Thank you very much.